Hello, everybody out there in comic book land. My name is George Serrano, a.k.a. The Don. And if you're watching this, you are watching major previews this month for the month of November. We are closing in on the end of the year, and yet the surprises keep kicking off. I will never do this show with anybody else but my boy here. Go ahead and introduce yourself. Alex Garcia is always with you, the cog, because I'm a part of this machine from the beginning of the year to the end of the year, baby. What the are we got going on? We got the comic book OG, the cog is here, and we are also hitting a bit of a milestone. We're almost up to a year of previews, a year of us looking into the solicitations and sort of, uh, you know, recommending the best and the brightest things to come to comic books. And what's interesting about that is you can give us a grade go ahead and check out the past episodes look at the things that we've recommended and tell us dare tell us <laughs> that they that these weren't the latest and greatest things to come to comic books and you know not to not to speak in hyperbole here but i think we are reaching a point of rarefied air in the comic book industry right now excitement is the name of the game as established publishers try new imprints as indie um as indie comics uh iron out getting some great talent to be dedicated to their to their uh to their cause everyone is operating on all cylinders right now and it's a very interesting time to talk about comic books so um that's what we're here to do if you've never seen this series before me and the cog will pick five issues five comic book issues that will be dropping this month in november and uh, things for you guys to look out for uh and i guess i will go ahead and start this one off for the month of november it's a lot of people talking but i gotta this this is a surrogate pick if anything because this was a pick you gave our beautiful listeners months ago and i am just piggybacking off of it um, my first pick for november is ultimate x-men number nine coming out november 13 2024 uh artist and writer peach momoko continues to flesh out this ultimate universe of x-men um absolutely downright i don't know if this is where it is appropriate but adorable <laughs> these stories these stories are adorable i'm not trying to infantilize any any of the characters here but like this feels like teenagers in, in, a, in a way that sometimes you would watch a television show and you're like everybody here is 30 like this, you know you watch 90210 and you're like or or yeah. say by the bell and you're like these are all 30 year olds yeah. i don't get why you're trying to pitch this as a teenage uh sort of sitcom Peace Momoko is really hammering down on the social aspects of high school, feeling like an outsider, being bullied, um, you know, and, and what it means to be so powerful and so powerless at the same time when you're not an adult yet, right? When you're 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 getting your powers of adulthood, but you're not in a in a uh, environment in which you can use them yet. Um, we're closing in on one chapter. The first trade paperback is just finishing up, so we're kind of um, starting a new arc here but it's a new arc that presents even more questions in the best way right because you want this stuff to sort of uh pique your interest in that way so um may storm is going to be fighting surge <laughs> in this uh that's what's showing up on the actual uh, cover of this uh lightning collides as may storm and surge finally confront each other but when surge is left weak and drained of her power may storm has even more questions and must investigate the mysterious cult surge is a part of and its relationship to the mutants of the ultimate universe if you haven't read this i won't go too far into spoilers but the reappropriation of things like um children of the atom the reappropriation of what X means. Maystorm is an absolute delight. Protect that woman at all costs. Yeah, <laughs> that young woman, like she, I love her design. I love her attitude, her tragic origin story. All of that stuff, I think, really, really rings true in this. And it's, again, it's a testament to Peach. It's a testament to Marvel. Um, this is a, uh, you know, closing in on a 60-year title, property ip it's very hard to make this stuff feel fresh and i am reading this um and it, it, it does it feels like it's bursting with energy the other thing i'll say is that 
Um, while it does exist in the ultimate universe, it even feels like a pocket in and of itself. <laughs> the ultimate universe is a pocket in the Marvel Comics world. And then this even feels like a pocket in the ultimate universe. <laughs> uh, and I can't wait to see how these characters play into the grand scheme of what all this is going to be once the maker, you know, uh, breaks out of his little prison. And see, I, I can't wait to see the world's smartest sociopath get tackled by a bunch of five, four foot three. <laughs> Japanese girls who <laughs> whoop his ass. It's going to be fantastic. Um, but you can't tell me you haven't been following this series. I No, I have. This is this is easily one of my favorite series. The Ultimate Universe is my favorite, one of my favorite worlds to dive into. I've spoken about it many times over, over this last year. And yeah, Peace Momoko, who I'm not the biggest fan of. In general, a lot of people go crazy if it's a Peach Momoko cover or or one of her books. People go crazy for it. Get punched over it. Right. (laughs) If that's your thing, that's your thing. But when when what I have always said about her is when it comes to telling a story that you can tell she's personally invested in, she goes at it. She goes hard. And the fact that they said, "Look, we're going to make the Ultimate Universe, and we're going to and we're going to give you a brand new X Men to deal with." And their own little, like you said, their own little pocket area in Japan, you can tell this was like, oh, like this was like, like giving her a present and saying, do what you want with it. Because this is completely different. There are familiar characters. We have Surge, you got Armor, a couple other ones. But this isn't the the homegrown X-Men that most people are used to. You're not Mm going to see no Jean Grey. You're not going to see Cyclops. You're not going to see Wolverine. You know, none of these characters show up in this. But yet she's telling a compelling story if you love anime you love manga if you love just good character good storytelling like like george said may storm is like one of the breakout characters of this world you know she everyone when when we first saw her in the solicitations way back you know almost a year ago now people were thinking oh this is like a baby storm or this is a a storm who's now growing up in japan and wrong we it's have completely a completely different character. <laughs> yeah, we have uh, a regular storm. We have a storm, and she's showing up someplace that makes sense, but still doing something different. And, and, <laughs> <laughs> and so what I what I even like about that is in this world, and that's something we're gonna start to explore with the coming of the end of the year and kind of in review for the ultimate universe. We don't have a lot of mutants. No. If you think about it, right? From the beginning of this world, because that was kind of the maker's idea was to bury all these heroes so he found a very good way to bury the x-men bury mutants so that now stand by if you haven't seen the spoilers we're gonna be having a lot of mutants show up yeah. including one of our favorite ones in a completely different form yep so yeah so ultimate x-men though is still a must read but guys give it a chance it's i from what i've gathered it is probably the lowest selling of the ultimate universe books Mm-hmm. But honestly, it's probably telling the most unique story. So give it a chance. Pick it up. The only thing I will say, even though I do, I am anticipating how they fold into all of this. I almost don't want them drawn by anyone else. It, it, it is going to look weird. <laughs> it's it going to be ja- it's going to be jarring as hell uh, when they're drawn by somebody else. Um, and I was familiar with Peach in the sense of these uh, variant covers, but I've never read any of her work this is um like you said it feels like the moment with with the hulk right i was made for this like this is is Mm -hmm. so in her wheelhouse that she executes it very well and what's even more interesting is i'm getting lessons on japan like it's it's teaching me about like uh what they do for luck what they do in school what games children play all that kind of stuff how they believe in spirits um so it's not only entertaining it's educational um, and you get to really see, especially as a mirror to our world, how people get roped up and divided into different sides as passionate groups rile them up to believe that they're here either for something better or for a bigger purpose with, you know, the cults and et cetera and so forth. So, yeah, check out uh, Ultimate X-Men number nine. What do you Definitely. got cooking up over there? Well, for my number one pick, it's kind of a back to basics, you know, um, it's, a, it's a title that. I feel I'm one of the few that's actually collecting it and enjoying it still. Yeah. Amazing Spider-Man number 61, but by a brand new, almost brand new uh, a, a team. We got Joe Kelly, one of my favorites, coming back to, to, to Spider-Man with Ed McGinnis. 
to tell what looks like to be some kind of bookend story that's going to completely change Spider-Man and really rope him into the, the bigger Marvel story. That's a bigger Marvel stories that are going on because the, the new spoilers, 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 if you haven't been aware, if you haven't been watching, but we have a new Sorcerer Supreme. We and do. it's a Sorcerer Supreme that I think some people have heard of, right? You've heard of Dr. Doom, right? I was say, I was say, he is a doctor. Um, he doesn't have any good bedside manner, though. <laughs> no, no. Listen, listen. I strongly believe that there's a there's there's a Doctor Doom out there that had the same backstory as Stephen Strange, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And he's yeah. he had some kind of accident. He's on the phone yelling at Reed Richards. God damn it, that's my patient. How dare you try to take my patient? I'm going to save this patient's life. He gets into a car crash. He ruins his hands. He travels all the way to uh to Car- Carmitage. Carmitage. He becomes a sorcerer supreme and becomes this great person. But unfortunately, not in the Marvel 616 universe. No. <laughs> in the no. Marvel 616 universe, he is he is the almighty loving uh Doctor Doom, who I personally love a lot, and I'm happy to see him in this new role. And he's so focused on this new role and does it, I can tell this is gonna be part of the story. Is Doctor Strange every year has to stop some force from destroying the Marvel 616 universe. Okay. So it's like every year it's like on his calendar, like, oh, I gotta go, I gotta go take care of this thing. But now that Dr. Doom's a source of Supreme, he's like, I don't, I'm not dealing with it. <laughs> yeah. I'm gonna delegate, I'm gonna delegate these duties. Is this a case similar to um like gosh, why is it escaping me right now? Superior Spider-Man, where because he like Doom is effective, even in bad stuff. <laughs> you know, he's effective. Yeah. Is he just trying to do his best and does? Is he still I, doing this for nefarious I, reasons? I guess is the question. I, I'm I part of me believe that, like I said, it, it's I haven't seen a spoiler in, in the solicitations. I, I didn't. There was already a preview of this in the last issue of Zeb Wells's run as to what's happening here. But there's no, there's no. The only connotation they're saying in the solicitations and a little bit of the story we got is Doctor Doom is just saying I'm busy. <laughs> this okay. is just one of the things I have to deal with. I'm just going to imbue Spider-Man with these powers, and part of part of the story is that apparently Spider-Man is going to die seven to eight times. Oh wow! You know what I mean? And oh, the eight, yes, the eight deaths. Of, yeah. the, eight, the, the story arc is being called the eight deaths of Spider-Man. So, in resolving this issue that the the Sorcerer Supreme must deal with. I guess he's going to die a bunch of times and Dr. Doom knows this and is going to somehow just imbue him with the abilities to do this. A uh, new, for you toy collectors, we got a new costume coming out where yeah. it looks like some Dr. Doom iron, uh, Dr. Doom iron uh, spider costume, thing, spider costume with uh, like his own robe of the Vishanti look going. It looks, it looks pretty awesome. This looks like just one of those fun uh, uh, Spider-Man stories that I do believe is going to then <clears throat> set up the new status quo for when this title does get inevitably reset for whoever takes over after this eight part story but this eight part story is looking great the fact that you got like look, we got we got sources supreme dr doom teaming up with spider-man to go down this crazy rabbit hole of mysticism and craziness if you didn't like the zeb wells run but you still love spidey this is the place to jump on because i have a feeling this is going to have major implications not just in the 616 universe but I think this might inspire some of the stuff that you're going to start seeing in the MCU. So stand by. What is our boy Rec Rap a part of all this? <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, what that was one of my favorite things to read in the last issue. Yeah. The last, was... uh, of Zeb Wells' is run is Rec Rap does show up and he yeah. shows up in a way that even in the editor's notes, Zeb Wells makes a little funny comment saying, All right, Joe, you got to use him now. <laughs> yeah, right, right, right. I'm like, I'm like okay. I'm not a fan of Rec Rap, so if he never shows up again, fine. But he's he's apparently some fan favorite character that inevitably will show up. He'll probably get a freaking miniseries soon. Watch. I, what I'll ask you is, what do you? How do you feel about this idea? Because I we've talked about this before, and you said one of the things you liked about the Zeb Wells run was this idea that he was sort of um, grounding Spidey back down to like a friendly neighborhood, dealing with like mm-hmm. Tombstone and stuff. Does this kind of go back on that this idea that he would be tackling someone as big as doom uh source of um, supreme yeah, stuff and, and does that bother I, I think you at all or it do doesn't you... bother me because a spider-man like batman like wolverine is a character that you put him 
he he can drive any of any story because that that's how good of a character they are. So mm-hmm. we got that massive sixty plus issue story from Zeb that was all ground level Spider Man stuff, with the exception of you know I know there was some multiverse thing going on with <laughs> jackpot nonsense and uh, yes yes you know who the 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 new boyfriend or whatever. But besides uh, that, it was very it was very street level. Yeah, we, we don't really want to remember guy. his name. I can't remember. No, nobody <laughs> likes that guy. Nobody likes that guy. Paul. <laughs> uh, um, so that's that's done. So I think this is the story that's going to take us into this next possibly big multiversal kind of Spider-Man story that <clears throat> seems to be what a lot of people like. Because now that even after, after ever since Deadpool Wolverine, a lot of people seem to have this buzz now of the idea of a Deadpool Spider-Man movie or show or something so and we've already had deadpool spider-man written by uh joe kelly yeah so i can see this possibly leading into some kind of big crazy next level story for spider-man because we just had 60 issues of ground street fight spider-man yeah i'd be time having for a multiversal space spidey again you're talking and now i feel so dumb because like it, it's now quite obvious to me that we've already, it's already been rumored for a long time that MCU Spider-Man is going to have a multiversal sort of thing going on. And all anyone could think about when it comes to MCU Spider-Man moving forward into these new uh, big Avengers films that's going to come out is what? I wonder what happens when Spider-Man meets Doctor Doom because Doctor Doom is Robert Downey Jr. And I wonder if any of that stuff is being kind of, uh, you know, th- this will be the ground for the ground that they kind of make up to sort of give us a uh, a device to then transfer over to the MCU. It's no, it's no um, coincidence that Spider Man is hanging with Doctor Doom in this story. It's my, in my opinion, um, right. and like you said, they could just be gearing him up for a, something a bit more fantastical, amazing, spectacular, even. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, so I'll be checking that out. Yeah. So, what's your number two pick? Um, I have become an evangelist of sorts lately, uh, as somebody who is a fan of DC comics and kind of fell off, uh, the bus when they hit us with event after event after event. Um, but there is a new incentive going on, an absolute incentive, if you will. And, uh, I was here talking about absolute Batman and now I'm here talking about absolute Superman. (laughs) So, coming out on November 6th, 2024, Jason Aaron's the writer, Rafa Sandoval is the artist, and we are getting a basically a new take on Superman. And as, as somebody who has skimmed through the issue already, uh, it just, again, feels like a fresh take on the character. Um, one of the things, and, you know, uh, not to spoil another one of the choices on my list, but... Um, you always hear that thing about like DC being God, uh, well, it's gods pretending to be human and stuff like that. And I, I feel like in a lot of ways, DC has protected the Trinity and made them th- these elite characters, perf- absolute perfect. You know, Batman's the absolute smartest. Superman is the absolute most wholesome. Uh, Wonder Woman's absolutely effective in everything that she does. And I think that this absolute uh, series is kind of grounding them a bit more. We already know that Bruce Wayne is not a, a billionaire because how the heck can you relate to a billionaire? <laughs> you know, like for all that we say about Batman, one of the things that he isn't is relatable in many cases because of that. I love how people say that Batman's more relatable than the alien who came from, <laughs> you know, middle America sometimes. <laughs> but it's similarly, you know, uh, even th- there's like this mythos around Superman of of almost like fate, like, you know, the, these two very perfect Kryptonians made this baby and was able to send him off as the last bit of hope. And we go back to that origin story and we make the the elves um, like laborers. They're, they're, they're the common people. They're the working class. And this idea that I love that Jason Aaron has kind of put out, which is that that Superman crest is the is the crest of the working class. It's right. what the working class has to wear. They're required to wear it because you're required to wear your social status at all times. And that means that this Superman is effectively born a man of the people, uh, as opposed to something that I feel like people like Zack Snyder wrestled with, with like, oh, he would hate this job. He would, he would want to fucking question whether or not he should be superman whether or not these people deserve it it's like no in my mind 
he wants to be a part of the people. He's oh, that's one of the things I feel like people never really get about Superman is that he rather stand next to us than fly above us. He very much works very hard to be the best human he can be because he thinks humans are fucking cool. And so uh, now that we have one stripped of all that all that perfectness, stripped of all that sheen, um, it's gonna be really interesting to watch them build the blocks to create a brand new legacy from one of the most famous, if not the most famous, comic book character of all time. Um, and watch all the blocks kind of fall. We won't know what this is going to be in a year's time. Maybe in a year's time, they're just over this whole experiment via like future state or 5G or whatever. But at this point, knowing that these uh, writers and artists are giving, getting, uh, you know, full reign over these series, it's so interesting. As even speaking to like the Peach Momoko uh, of it all, it's really interesting to see what stories have been kind of laying dormant in these people's minds, waiting for an opportunity like this for them to come into fruition. Jason Aaron is a trusted source. He gets it. I loved his store. <laughs> store was absolutely fantastic and transformative. Quite literally, things are being adapted from it as of a couple of years ago. Yeah. Um, so watching him take on another very super powered person who is who has a hand in fate and you know uh you know restraint and all that kind of stuff has been really refreshing um and i love this like living suit thing that he has going on where it's like kind of like talking to him almost like his jarvis if you right. will um right. but uh are you excited and have you kind of been had your interest peaked with this absolute superman at all oh yeah i mean i joke I mean, in, in last last month i mentioned how DC has really been hitting out of park. Uh, DC is not my favorite publisher. You know, it, they've they've done notoriously year after year have found a ways to just kind of push me out, right? And but yet this 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 new revolution they're going through with this all in and abs and and the absolute, I find myself wanting to read more and more DC, especially this absolute stuff. Absolute Batman was amazing. Absolute yeah. Wonder Woman was probably, in my opinion, the best of the three, and Absolute Superman to me, it's only going to get better and better. Some people have already been like, ah, it's the worst one of the three. It's the first issue. <laughs> it, it's introducing a whole new status quo for a character that oftentimes people don't like when his status quo changes. So oh, I'm not surprised. I'm not surprised if the first issue turns people off, right? Because this isn't your, your Superman. This isn't any iteration of Superman. Usually every other, even when they change Superman, it's still all about, hey, if he's still the cream of the crop. He's still at the top, and now it's a matter of him realizing that or gaining that next level of understanding of why he's basically the Jesus figure of the world. Mm -hmm. This is a this common is a man. Superman. This is super, you're right. This is regular Superman. You know what I mean? So what kind of stories can come out of this? Because what I'm intrigued by is now when they eventually, like, how does, like, that's a whole different perspective on now dealing with Lex Luthor. Right? Oh, 100 percent that that common man perspective of now you're not only you're going up against somebody's evil, but now you have that perspective of a common man looking at looking at like the billionaire. Oh, you're the evil billionaire. Oh, man, I really hate you. <laughs> like, I really got to deal with you. Uh, yeah. What happens when eventually they do a, an absolute general Zod? How oh, is wow. that going to look? You know what I mean? So there's so much to be told here. And like you said, Jason Aaron, he's one of my favorite writers. You you basically put almost anything in that man's hands and I try it. And he, because not not to knock any of the other great writers out there, but Jason Aaron, like he he's willing to try anything. He'll he'll tell Superman stories, which he just he told a regular action comic story not to, not to, not too many months ago, and yeah. it was a weird, bizarro, literally bizarro tale, a three issue bizarro tale. He's also the guy that will write a story like Scout. He'll write Southern Bastards. He'll write a female Thor. He'll yeah. write oh, we'll talk about this in a in a couple of minutes. Ninja Turtles. Yeah. And then he'll also then and write uh, an, another book is that coming out called Bug Wars. <laughs> this is someone who's not scared to try stuff, to tell different tales. So I love the idea of him now saying, look, I, I, you want me to tell a Superman story? We're going to tell a different Superman story. And he's telling it. And I'm, I, I'm, I'm all for this, this absolute stuff. I can't wait to dive into it more. And they got more absolute titles coming out. So I will be spending some money on DC. What's super interesting, I'll say before we uh, move on to the next pick, is that um, 
Superman, America, like that stuff goes hand in hand, right? Americana and Superman. Mm -hmm. This first issue from previews already has him facing off with the military and big business, <laughs> which are the two biggest American <laughs> things going on right now. Oh, and well, that's you know? another spoiler. That's another spoiler if you haven't read it yet. Yeah, he doesn't land. He doesn't land in America in this world. Right. Right, which will also give him more empathy for the entire world, where we had right. to kind of retcon and go back and be like, well, actually, he's going to give up his American citizenship so that he could be more of the world. In this, no, we're starting from, that's how it should have kind of been from the beginning. So we're going to do that from the beginning here. Right. But yeah, the idea that we, we always bolster our military and our capitalism, and those are the first two things that he mm -hmm. kind of dismantles in his thing it, it, it's an interesting thing because he's always supposed to represent the best of us and maybe we have lost sight a little bit and maybe absolute uh superman can uh, get us there yeah so Dang. yeah so now speaking of status quo is though because, <laughs> yeah it's, it's a we got we got a lot of status quo is changing going back and forth i am loving the post krakoa era in marvel I'm really enjoying it. And one of the things I'm really, really enjoying is Uncanny X-Men with the next issue of Uncanny X-Men being on number five. Gail Simone, David Marquez, they have been telling a hell of a story. <clears throat> they The first issue kind of just resets the team. You get, you get Rogue, you got Gambit, but you also have this uh, militant team, mili uh, military that seems to be kind of going back to the whole idea of Sentinel-1 if you remember that from the 198 days, the yeah. House of M time, they're coming in. The Xavier Institute is now, I believe, a jail unto itself. And it seems that this team has their own special mutant hunting mutants. In the pages of pretty much... Is that the, like similar the, to the Hound concept of the Hounds? Yes. Kind of kind of like the Hound. Yes, exactly. Okay. If you remember that from... Yeah. Oof, taking it back. But yeah, exactly. So now in not in the pages of Uncanny X Men, X Men, and e, like even NYX and Extraordinary mm -hmm. X Men, they've introduced a lot of brand new mutants. In Uncanny X Men, they introduced these four new mutants. Well, one of them might not even be a mutant. She's already said she is not a mutant, and they're all fascinating. I think they're all very interesting. Uh, we got one that has like the powers of. of to, to commune with the death, with de the dead, and know your your background as far as who you've killed or what you've done to be where you're at. A character who, when they when they when they first were introduced, and they he he immediately in <laughs> dealt with Wolverine. That was fun. Uh, another character who she has the ability to kind of control how, like, kind of like a if you remember the character Yo Yo from yes. Secret Warriors, kind of kind of go control how much like this microsecond of time to to go really fast the the one character who has come out and said hey i'm not a mutant she she teams up with a horse and becomes almost like a valkyrie oh wow but and she and she one said the horse. i think i remember this horse thing and i was thinking like what the heck does the horse have to do with yeah. all this <laughs> so no it, it's it's it, they're in this title they're being hunted by this hound create cre creation that seems to have ties to xavier because, you know, Xavier has ties to every horrible little mutant secret out there. And Xavier right now is a prisoner. At the end of the Krakoan age, we see the, the United States does get him, lock him up. But now this agency wants to use him to power Cerebro to, of course, find mutants. Because mutants are, once again, on, on the run. So now at the end of this story, we're going to see how all of these things have more in common with each other than we realize, which is also going to lead us to where these four brand new mutants, are they going to become the steadfast students of the previous uh, uh, ages of X-Men or, or possibly villains? Because we've seen that happen. Or might they even kill one or two of them? We right. don't know. But all I can tell you is these stories have been very engaging. I, I find myself, I, I thought all the X books were going to, I would, I was going to read the first issue or two of each one and then just be like, you know what? Give me back Rakoa or, you know, I'm tired. <laughs> Take of me time. back. <laughs> Take me back. Right. You know, but no, I, I'm very much liking how it's being told. It's it, yeah. Some people will say, well, it's kind of the same old, same old. What do you expect from, from titles that have been around for 60 plus years? Yeah. But yet they're still finding ways to make it engaging. 
Gail Simone knows how to write good characters, knows how to write good dialogue. David Marquez on the art has been absolutely gorgeous. So, and now giving us these new characters to also give us this new perspective on, while also elevating older characters like Rogue and Gambit to mm-hmm. the to the, they're like the 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 head the head Mister and the head mistress of yeah. of this team, you know, because you're not seeing Cyclops in this book, you're not seeing you're not seeing even even Wolverine who does show up in it takes like a back seat. Like he's constantly just being like, I'm trying to get the hell out of here, man. I'm tired of this. He almost reminds me like the groundskeeper of the place. Like he just kind of like, I'm going to go do something else. I'm going to go do something. I got, I got to go trim a hedge. I'll see (laughs) I'll see in a couple episodes. Yeah, exactly. And so we, and this book, we get these four new characters. We get characters that a lot of people do want to see more of, especially ever since stuff like X-Men 97 and Deadpool Wolverine, because everybody right now is on this, you know, everybody wants to make a name for themselves, right? Oh, yeah. With the whole gambit, with the whole gambit stuff, and you're you want it, you're getting it on Candy X Men. So I highly recommend you pick it up. Awesome. Um, yeah, it is. It, 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 there is an embarrassment of riches going on just in the X Men world right now. I just talked about yeah. like if you, you don't like Mainline, you can go to Ultimate, but Mainline is doing a lot of cool things. And Gail Simone is 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 a comic fan, seemingly first before being a comic writer like it, like there's a lot of love she has for these characters but simi- uh, uh, simultaneously she's very active on social media and she will go on on twitter or x in that cesspool <laughs> and say things like what's a character you haven't seen in a while what why haven't these characters ever been together in the same panel who in the x-men are you missing kind of stuff and she's gauging the fan base and a lot of times um writing can be a very insular thing where you kind of have your blinders on and you're going to tell a story you want to tell regardless i think gail is doing that but also getting sample sizes from the actual fan base and seeing what they want and i think that's why that's working as well and i also think that's why off the rip they pushed Gambit and Rogue together because <laughs> I think a lot of people wanted that. There were some people that had bad taste in their mouths after 97. <laughs> and we're like, uh, you know, because they, again, status quo, right? Like, I want ro- my Rogue and my Gambit together. Right. They got to be together. But similar to the groundskeeper thing, like, those two have always been on the, like, if the X-Men line up, those guys are on the outside. You know what I'm saying? Like, those guys are, they're not trying to take center stage. They're, they'll they'll be there for the team and they'll support. But the idea that you push everyone else out the way, put them in the center, give them a spotlight. I know Rogue is quite literally started as a villain. <laughs> Gambit was a thief. So these headmaster, this new headmaster and headmistress or this, these new, uh, this new le- leadership is not perfect. Already from the rip. But they might be perfect leaders because they're imperfect they're not they're not xavier who you know oh holier than thou and then you find out about all his skeletons in his closet you know i did it for a reason yeah everything everything (laughs) Xavier, everything always for a reason um so yeah no i really really like that take and i i do think that those characters should be elevated we're at the point now where i mean i've always said that they kind of um misused rogue in the in, in all the films we've now have what maybe nine, 10, 11 X-Men films without a real, like <laughs> a real rogue that people can hold on to. Yeah. Um, and mm-hmm. uh, yeah, as Gail Simone writes powerful women, she's done it her whole career. So mm-hmm. seeing that kind of flesh out as well is, is really interesting. And then, yeah, why not? I mean, if you could have her Globman or whatever, why not have this horse <laughs> mutant character? This is literally the book to throw everything against the wall and see what sticks, right? Because you can just be like, well, I mean, I love this idea that mutations don't have to be perfect. You don't have to be a, a supermodel who can, you know, turn water into ice. Sometimes you're you need a, a horse, and you guys are two sides yeah. of the same coin. So I think that's interesting too. Yeah. So what do you got for your second pick, George? Well, you were talking about status quo, and one of the things that I like about DC is that they will continue to sort of harken back to their more humble beginnings, if you will. But since I started reading DC Heavy, which would be around the New 52 era, they've had a real hard time nailing down how they want to portray the Justice Society of America. What? Looking for us, <laughs> the Justice Society, which actually predates the Justice League. And so now we have Justice Society of America, number one, coming out November 6, 2024. Uh, written by friend of the show. I'll keep saying it until he's on, Jeff Lemire. 
We do love you, Jeff. We, we love you, love Jeff. You. We love you. We love you, bro. There's a seat right here for you all the time. Um, and it says the new era of the JSA begins here. Longtime fan favorite characters Hawkman, Hawk Girl, Jade, Obsidian, Jesse Quick, Our Man, Ted Grant, and Sandman are all back on the roster as DC's first superhero team faces their greatest and most personal challenge yet. Will the Golden Age ideals hold true in a world recovering from the events of absolute power? Or do they need more a hardcore approach to stand a chance against the new Injustice Society of America? So I've read a bunch of JSA stuff, and it's really interesting. You know, they try to introduce them in metal. Um, like they said, like, they were like locked away or something like that. They've always, they're always somewhere existing, yeah. and they have constantly a hard time bringing them in. If anyone can get these characters, it's Jeff Lemire. Again, we, we've raved on here about how he was able to handle Batman and um, Robin. When he did that Robin and Batman book, um, he in that book he harkens back to the Justice League. He harkens back to the creation of these sidekicks in the history of DC. Um, this is a fun playground for him because I don't think anyone had. I think the age in which people had very strong opinions about this team, those people are not here, <laughs> or they won't be here for much longer. Not to sound morbid. But these characters do stand the test of time. So how do you redefine them for a new age? Um, and giving the reins to Jeff Lemire seems super smart. Um, they don't have to. They could leave this all in the dust. All of this stuff could be left in the dust as they constantly try to leave the first human torch in the dust in Marvel all the time. And then they're like, whoa, whoa, whoa no, no, he's back. Hammond is back. We got him. You know, he's on the team now. <laughs> somebody somebody put a new battery in him. So here yeah, he is. Yeah, so now he's back. Um, let's do it. Let's put a new can of paint on this amazing old classic muscle car that has always proven to work with these tried and true characters and let's reintroduce them to a new fan base and i can't think of anybody um as qualified to do that as jeff lemire so i will be definitely picking up jsa number one when it drops yeah no you had me at jeff lemire even the justice society <laughs> in general was was something that yeah dc constantly tries to resuscitate interest in the justice society i mean they did it years ago, and Jeff Johns had a very good run on the book. Yep. Then just recently, I think Jeff Johns did it again. Yep. Following, It was kind of following the, the, the metal stuff and following one of the crisis events. And now oh, they're handing it to another a name who you know can handle these things, Jeff Lemire. So yep. knowing that he's writing this and... The cast of characters on this book, even if you're not a big DC fan, like I'm not, and because I and I do know these characters, mm -hmm. they are old characters, yeah. Which I always say with a with a smile on my face because people go, "Oh, well, these characters are so old. How am I supposed to know them?" You know, Batman. You know, yeah. Superman. A hundred percent. You know, Spider Man. These aren't these aren't you know five ten year old characters. So why can't you just? take the chance on learning some new old characters because yeah. a lot of these characters you wouldn't have your new or newer favorite character without them you don't Definitely. get you don't you don't get Hal Jordan without Alan Scott 100%. you don't you don't get Barry and Wally without without Jay Garrick Flash yeah so why not take a chance on some of these older characters <clears throat> and there are even easy ways to get into them if you grew up like me and me and the Don here did watching Justice League and Justice League Unlimited, a lot of these characters were featured in that. Like, um, um, what, oh man, I'm losing uh, the the cat character, uh, Wildcat, Wildcat, yes, Wildcat had some great episodes with Black Canary on yeah. Justice League and Justice League Unlimited. A character that even when they first showed up, even on Justice League, th those episodes, I was like, who, who is that? Cat, it's a big cat, <laughs> dude. A, is that is that a, is that a, is that a wannabe Batman? Oh, it's yeah. a cat. I'm like, what am I looking at? You know. And then you learn about these characters. You're like, man, these characters have been around for a long, long time, and they're interesting. They have their own backstories. They have their own ways of being. And now that you're putting all this on a on a team, reforging the Justice Society with a name again like Jeff Lemire, I, I'll give it a shot. Again, you this is all part of. The new DC stuff. Get I think I think the cock said the, said it the best. You'll be surprised how much of the JSA DNA is in everything that you've ever seen, everything that you've ever watched. You bring up Ted. It's, it's Ted Grant is the Wildcat, I believe. Yeah, Ted Grant. Um, yes. Um, and he is actually shown to be the trainer of Black Canary in Arrow. 
uh, Ted, he runs a gym in, in Arrow, if I'm not mistaken. Um, we got the pleasure of getting a lot of these characters, getting a new fresh coat of paint in Stargirl. When Stargirl came out, that was a real, real focus on the JSA and the Injustice Society of America um, and bringing in characters like um, Our Man and um, Dr. Midnight and stuff like that. So it's, like it's, it, Midnight, yeah. yeah, it's quite possible. Um, and the more DC has always flourished in their ability to uh, honor their own history, they are in a very unique position because marvel the marvel that most know doesn't start kicking off until the 60s so dc has a 20 year head start of history that whenever they just get bored they can just pull out from and showcase right uh 20 years head start in the game and they that's a lot yeah if the only thing that ties marvel back that far is um well uh, the human torch but also cap and cap was written under timely technically so, you know, they had to kind of <laughs> bring his ass back. But with a 20-year head start, yeah, man, go back and uh, do this. Um, we'll talk about Black Canary in a little bit, but some of these characters with the right art, with the right art, author, Arthur, I'm trying to say Arthur, with the right author, writer, artist, um, can redefine them. We've seen this happen time and time again, and I want to see how this JSA works for an, a whole new class of reader. So take it a shot. And speaking of giving new things, even if, even if it's an old thing, you're still giving it a shot. Yeah. Guys, the Energon universe <laughs> just continues to percolate. It just, it's just, it's just cooking on all levels. You've been hearing us talk about it for, for the whole year. Yeah. Transformers, Duke, Cobra Commander, Destro, Scarlet. We finally, finally it all leads. To bringing back G.I. Joe number one. It's literally it's all coming. been set up for it, here. This it, is the it's, dominoes. It's all, it's all, fell all down. been building up to this, right? We got yeah. we got Joshua Williamson and Tom Riley with Jordi Belair, um, amazing, amazing uh inker and, and colorist, I believe. They're they're finally bringing out uh, G.I. Joe number one. All these stories, the stories from Duke, from Cobra Commander, from Destro, Scarlet, it all is finally coming into G.I. Joe. And for those of you who are like, well, how does this tie into the whole Energon universe with the Transformers and Void Rivals? Oh, it does. Because <laughs> the, whole, the whole thing behind them is, one, it all started in Transformers where a few, a few random soldiers, I won't tell you who, dealt with a couple of the Decepticons. And that led down a rabbit hole. And then in the meantime, Cobra Commander and Destro and all these guys are finding Energon to power their war devices. Okay. So now G.I. Joe is being brought together to, one, deal with these factions, this, this Cobra faction that has now risen to power because of Cobra Commander and Destro and the, 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 the Zamox twins. You know, uh, if you remember those guys, the, the, the two twins that could feel each other's pain, yeah. they, br they brought them in. And, and this, at the same time, as they're also trying to figure out, well, what's, what's the deal with these giant robots that can transform into machines? They're also having to deal with the real present dangers of, the, of just the world itself, right? We have we have these arms dealers and enigmatic uh, uh, forces of Cobra, and there there is Cobra Law. If you haven't been, if you haven't been reading it, spoiler spoilers that Cobra Law does exist in this world, as well as as well as the the ninja the ninja clans from Storm Shadow and and uh, Snake Eyes's background. They're very much in the shadows and doing do what they're doing. So GI Joe has a lot to deal with and eventually the head-on collision of gi joe dealing with the transformers once again and who knows because in, in their eyes if you if, if if it's a robot and it transforms it's the bad guys there's no yeah, and, and they're the quite literally aliens right we're protecting our border gi joe like he's you know right. like that's his, there it that's is. his job uh and you know i shudder to think of uh you know Cobra Commander and any of the Decepticons being on the same page. Like that is there's nothing good coming from any from right. any of that stuff. How interesting will that be when this all comes together? And again, I know we say this quite often, but get on the ground floor because Hollywood is starving for this story. If they could have done right. this movie yesterday, they would have. 
but they've been given the patience to let let these people flesh out the story. We got if you haven't seen the latest, I can't even remember what film it was. It must have been it was a Transformers movie, right? Where they yeah, it was a Transformers movie. That, um, what was it called? Is it, it is it like the, the Beast Wars one? The one that just it happened? was the Beast Wars one. But what was it called? It was like Transformers Rise of the Beast or something. Rise of the Beast, I believe, it was called. Yes. Yeah. So yeah, in that, at the very at the yeah. very end, they just kind of open the door and oh yeah, we have this thing called GI Joe. And that's, right. and that's where they leave it. Be- that's where they leave it because there's nothing to do with it yet. They don't have they don't have storytellers like the comic does. And right. again, they're having so much fun with adding a level of severity and adding a level of, of maturity to this Energon universe. These are toys we smashed together when we were kids. <laughs> Not to say that this stuff can't be deep, as we've seen in Transformers 1. There's obviously more... Just the same way that th- these uh, characters are mining for Energon, there's so much good story to mine for in here. Right. And these scribes, these modern day scribes for the new legends that are G.I. Joe and Transformers are putting the bricks in front of them as they literally walk, walk in front of them. And you, you've watched this all unfold. Now it looks, now parts of the map are more colored in than they ever were. But you can remember a point when there was no map. <laughs> you can remember a point yeah. where... Like, where is all this going? Where, how is all this going to connect? And it's got to feel very um, rewarding as a reader to watch some of these dots and you know some of these red strings yeah. and the conspiracy thing start to exactly. connect finally. The, the Charlie days. The Charlie. Oh my God, where is it going to go? It's it's been it's been a blast, you know, because as someone who grew up watching a lot of this stuff, especially Transformers, not re- I was a GI Joe fan, but not as deep as G- as Transformers. But now seeing them, like you said, like the roadmap is being rewritten and elevated to that to the point where, like, I, I in the past I would have never cared about reading a GI Joe comic. I I've, I've kind of hid here and there would pick up an issue, but I am hyped for this because it's just again continuing this brand new world building. That where's it gonna go? Where's it gonna go? How's it all gonna tie in together? I can't wait. And like just like the Don just said. It's, this is still in its infancy, as crazy as it is. We've got over 12 issues of Transformers. G.I. Joe technically, even though this is the G.I. Joe number one, has already had you know five issues of Destro, five issues of Cobra Commander, about five issues of Duke, five issues of Scarlet. But it's still, this is all still very introductory. And a lot of these stories you can read in a quick sitting because they're that, they're page turners. Yeah. And the best thing I love is the fact that these, if you are a fan of those, the cartoon, I don't know uh, if you if you read the comics back in the day, the comics were were a lot more adult driven. Mm-hmm. But if you only knew the cartoons, Cobra was always on the run. Cobra Commander was a coward. Destro was a pushover almost. Definitely, these are not those characters. Cobra Commander is 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 straight out of a horror film. Destro, I've seen excuse Destro. my French, is no bullshit. Yeah, I see that. <laughs> this is it. someone that has just literally just been executing people and taking care of business with his own hands, as well as as well as uh, anybody who's willing to work with him. Scarlet and dealing with what she's dealing with with the ninja clans. These these aren't you know your your friendly neighborhood ninjas who you know kick you in the face and you know leave you unconscious. Now these are ninjas. They're slicing throats and cutting off people's arms. So if you want something that's gonna be be more catered to, to the adult audience and tell you it's still a great story. Here we are. Brand new number one for you to start off and pick up those trays if you can. What I will also say is if you've if you're alive, if blood is going through your veins, you've heard the name G.I. Joe. And I can just roughly guess that you are not uh, if you're listening to this, if you're watching this, if you were able to find what a YouTube was, um, that I can guess that you weren't alive when the G.I. Joe number one dropped, when it first dropped, <laughs> ever. <laughs> you got it now. It's right now. You know what I'm saying? Right now, you can jump in on this universe where your kids and your grandkids will be, have watched the Energon cinematic universe and been like, oh my God, what's going to happen next? And you're like, oh, I know what happens next. <laughs> I was on this road <laughs> about 15 years ago <laughs> when it got paved. I know, you know, right. I was there when it was written <laughs> kind of stuff. <laughs> um, it's got to be cool to get on the ground floor or something like that. I was I was born in it. You were merely a yeah, yeah, really... <laughs> You were merely a Michael Bay fan. <laughs> <laughs> um, awesome stuff. Awesome stuff. Uh, but where, where are you going with us next time? I have a love hate relationship with a certain creator. Um, 
I do, I do. We come here oftentimes and we talk about uh, creators we love. And there is a creator that I had a bit of, you know, uh, a thorn in my paw over. Um, and it is a writer, most people know, by Tom King. Uh, Tom King had taken over Batman after Scott Snyder did. And I just wasn't buying his very morose characterization of the character, especially given how much growth he had in the Scott Snyder run, how big the Bat family got. And now all of a sudden he's a Batman that can't rev um, can't rely on anyone, can't d doesn't lean on anyone, wants to do everything by himself, gets tricked into a marriage with a thief and then <laughs> kind of gets played, you know? So like really, really took, um, Really, really took a lot of the heart out of that story, in my opinion. Obviously, people have different opinions. Um, but the reason why I was semi-excited to read T King's run is because I absolutely adore Tom King's Vision series. And I absolutely adore Tom King's Mr. Miracle. I own both. I own Mr. Miracle in hardcover. And I, it's still in the wrapping because I just I don't even want to touch it. I love those stories. They are deep dives into characters that we don't get much introspection from. And in doing so, he's given these characters new life. And while I'm, I, I've kind of come around to this idea that maybe I don't like him writing long-standing status quo characters. That's that's where my mind is wrapping around. Tom King on a long-standing character may not be my cup of tea. But you give him something short, something where he has a meaning, where he has something that he specifically wants to say, and I think the guy knocks it out of the park. And his next little outing is dealing with somebody that we were just talking about in the JSA. It's dealing with Black Canary. So coming out this month is Black Canary Best of the Best Number One. Comes out on November 27th. Uh, the solicitation reads, Black Canary faces her toughest opponent yet, Lady Shiva, in a battle to determine who is the single greatest hand-to-hand -hand fighter in the DC universe. To make it to the final round, Black Canary will need all her fighting skill and ability, plus additional training for some of DC's most accomplished fighters, including Batman, Wildcat, and even her mother, the OG Black Canary. So... This is going to be really, really fun stuff. Uh, it comes out, I, I said, on uh, November 27th. Um, I like Black Canary as a character. I, I've always kind of dug her as a character. The covers are gorgeous. The artwork is gorgeous. Um, Lady Shiva is somebody who doesn't get enough credit in the DC universe, even though she's often touted as the best hand-to-hand -hand fighter. She doesn't show up in a lot of, um, in a lot of stories. We get an embarrassment of riches this month because she's actually also in Bad Girl number one. Uh, so that's fantastic too. Uh, you know, a little extra, <laughs> a little extra recommendation over there. I love Ka Cassandra Kane. I love her background with Lady Shiva, and they'll be dealing with some stuff there too. But this idea of like a turn, a fighting tournament in DC with hand-to-hand -hand fighters, and we're in the POV of Black Canary, one of the most skilled, but also kind of a you know, a, a common woman. She doesn't have super strength. She has the canary cry. I don't know if that's, you know, I got to talk about disqualifications and stuff when it comes to, <laughs> when it comes to using some stuff. But um, she, it's, Black Canary is not popular because she just whoops everybody's ass. Black Canary is popular because she whoops ass. And when she gets her ass whooped, she keeps coming. And this idea that um, we are trying to find out who the best of the best is and this series might tackle that, that becomes canon then, right? Who is the number one fighter in uh, DC? They will establish that in this series, um, and I just can't wait for it. Uh, there's not much to say because, again, this will be a miniseries, um, but I'm super excited to see what Tom has in store for uh, old Dinah. But no, I have, I have you heard of this series? Have you heard uh, has this yeah. reached your radar? No, at all? Yeah, I mean, it's you kind of hit it on the head with Tom King. I, I agree. You, I was not a fan of his Batman run. But whenever Tom is told, hey, man, you got 10 issues, you got 12 issues, you got eight issues to tell a very focused story on a character, he knocks it out the park. Whether, like you said, it was Vision or Miracle Man or Mr. Miracle, sorry, Mr. Miracle, or, <laughs> even, man. or even Supergirl, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> or, or even Supergirl, he did, he did, he did that miniseries on Supergirl recently. He even did a, uh, a, Rorschach, a Rorschach miniseries not too long ago. He, you, you tell him, hey man, give, give me a solid twelve issues about this one character, and you're going to get a solid story from this person. So the and again, if if, if you give him like a, I, hate, I hate to say it like this, but a C or D list character, he elevates them. He yeah. elevates them, and this is a character, Black Canary, who like it's it's weird on the low, 
the last like 20 years, this character has gotten a lot of attention. You know, mm-hmm. she 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 was in she was in Arrow. She was yep. in uh, Heroes. What was it called? The the Heroes of Tomorrow. Legends. Legends, Legends of, tomorrow. of Tomorrow. Yep. Um. And now she's been featured a lot. Birds in her of Prey. Own miniseries. She's Birds of Prey. Uh, and as well as. And I mean the movie, but also the comic. <laughs> but, but, yeah, but also the comics, right? I think also what was it? Gotham City Sirens. I think she even showed up on. Yeah. And now she's getting this miniseries by Tom King. She also did play a kind of a, a, a big enough role in absolute power, you mm-hmm. know, and now we're getting, we're getting, her, giving her her own miniseries by this top, top level talent. So yeah, I'm excited for this. I want to see where this goes. I'm wondering how much of the absolute power stuff is going to be in this, or is this going to be its own little, Hey, you know, its own little continuity on the side. Like almost you know? out of time. A bit yeah. like it could it could take place anywhere kind of stuff, because uh, mm-hmm. it doesn't say it's got, it, that that we'll be dealing with a lot of the of effects of that stuff. But you, it might be right there in the sweet spot for DC All In, right. um, and Dinah. You know, we're talking about Dinah Laurel Lance, uh, Dinah Drake. Her mother uh, is from 1947. You know, like <laughs> doesn't get more OG than that. And then Dinah right. comes in in the I want to say in the 80s, 84. Right. Uh, 83 83 so she just celebrated her 40th anniversary as a character and i w- i would say if i had to guess people know more about harley quinn than they do about about uh dinah so it, it's time to it's time to raise that woman's stake as always or just matter of fact just remind people is i guess is what i'll say <laughs> to put some respect on black canary's name because you yeah, will right. be screaming it later and she might be screaming it later too but if she's screaming it at you you won't be here very long so <laughs> just ask, just ask uh, good old Ollie. Yeah, she's given yeah. Ollie the business a few times. Yeah, yeah, I love that too. She she'll tell him straight up, and she'll tell anyone straight up. She I like you said I really liked real quick that she, she became a Green Lantern in um in deceased. You know, just another another kind of badass role for her. They knew they know that that character runs on willpower. That's right. she's yeah, doesn't right. have much past that. So yeah. uh, I mean, one so, of one of my favorite episodes of what was it Justice League Unlimited. Was where they have her fight Wonder Woman and Vixen, I believe. Yeah, yeah. And she like whoops all their asses. <laughs> yeah, a hundred percent. And she'll do it in fishnets and a leather jacket. You know yeah, what I'm right. saying? So understand. Female empowerment, baby. Gang, gang. <laughs> what what so do you now, got up next, Broski? Hey, if, so now to, to kind of just kind of flip it on on everybody, bring a little all ages because we are all ages, right? Comics yeah, are yeah. for everybody. At the end of I the day, comics so. are for everybody. And I'm bringing it back to good old woohoo days with DuckTales number one like comics. Because it's it's DuckTales. Who doesn't love DuckTales? Everybody loves DuckTales. We, re- we recently covered uh, Scrooge McDuck and the Infinity Dime number yeah. one uh, a couple months ago, which was by Marvel. So this, this is kind of weird. It can get confusing if you're someone that wants consistency or just continuity. Mm-hmm. But this is being brought to you by Dynamite Comics because Dynamite still has the license to do a lot of Disney stuff and license to do a lot of things. License to do Thundercats, um, Johnny Quest. They've even just recently announced Silverhawks. Did they snatch up the Hanna Barbera stuff? Pretty much all the all the Hanna Barbera stuff, right? So they just got this the, the, these licenses to just produce these great comics, and they're taking it very seriously. And this Ducktales, uh, this Ducktales book that's coming out. I am not going to sleep on it because, like I said, Dynamite has been killing it. We got Brandon Montclair and Tommaso Ronda producing this book. It looks gorgeous. If you're a fan of the cartoon or if if you're old enough to remember even the DuckTales comics, it looks just like that. It's, it's bringing those cartoons, those original comics to life, bringing it to this new era. And I've already previewed a bunch of the pages. And what's beautiful about it is, like I said, it does look just like those old, uh, old cartoons. But what's great is in a lot of the preview pages, they show where Scrooge is telling Huey, Dewey and Louie <clears throat> stories of when he was going on his adventures. And whenever he goes back, like his his flashbacks look like the panels the way they did back in the in the 30s and 40s that's really you know what I mean? yeah, 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 yeah right it's it's great i was like when i when i seen it i was like oh the art just changed and i was like oh they're making they're making it look like it did back in the day yeah this is fantastic 
This is, again, Dynamite just knowing what they have in their hands, paying homage to the, the source material, but still giving you something brand new that can relate. And this, what I love about this is it's for everybody. Yeah. Right. Sometimes, sometimes in, in discussing a lot of the stuff we were just talking about, these aren't comics that you can really hand to anyone, <clears throat> but right. I always love comics that I can go. I love this and I'm going to hand it to my kids as a teacher. I'm going to hand it to my students and you can, you can recommend it to anybody. You yeah. can recommend it to somebody our age. You can recommend it to older people. Hey, remember, remember, remember Scrooge McDuck comics back in the day and all this stuff. These are comics that very much existed. And you can hand this to any kid. I know you have nieces and nephews. Yeah. Hey, hey, nieces and nephew, check out this DuckTales comic. And you don't have to know 100 years of continuity to get us there. Um, Yeah. So one of the things that I kind of uh, had told to me, I was watching a documentary uh, this weekend, and it was a documentary about an artist who, I'm sorry, a writer who wrote a lot of what, you know, like kids would read in high school and stuff. And uh, somebody went to great lengths to kind of explain that sometimes when someone writes something all ages or someone writes something for for that's accessible for younger people that people kind of counted counted out like uh, counted out or they they disregard it. Rush it off. And uh, the person was trying to explain that it almost takes more uh, intelligence to be able to write for everyone. For the youngest people to still get the message and also the older people to get the message as well for everyone to meet in the middle with this story and those stories shouldn't be discarded if anything they should be the standard because that's what connects these generations uh, and that's what connects people overall um it's the idea i mean it, we've done what they have a million times with like animation right how some people will just kind of disregard animation as a childish method of storytelling and we've seen amazing, especially Studio Ghibli, right? Amazing uh, stories told in that medium. And this is just another example of that. You can see on the cover and you can dismiss it, but someone took the time to draw every one of those panels, write every one of those word bubbles, write the, this entire story. And they didn't do it as a cash grab. They did it as a method to connect people to this stuff that they've already loved. Um, he, Quick uh, spoiler alert! I already know one of my one of my picks for uh, February 2025 coming out of Dynamite. The freaking Herculoids, number one, bro. What? <laughs> I watched the Herculoids so much as a kid. Who was, who was like your no favorite? One... Who was your favorite? Who was your favorite? I think it was the the the, the thing that used to shoot the the, 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 the triceratops. Yeah, triceratops. Yeah, I, I, I think, dude, I think just... wasn't his name like Tungo or Unga or, right, or Gleep. Is it Gleep? The blobs? The yeah, blobs? I was down with two. Was, was, wasn't it like Gleep and Gloop Glo- or something Glo- like that? or whatever. <laughs> <laughs> Comple- completely down with that as well. In a world in which nostalgia is, you know, nostalgia, nostalgic content is king in a lot of ways, mm-hmm. people do want to go back to their comforts, things they remember, and selfishly still hold on, and selfishly yeah. still want them to evolve. And this is one of those rare instances where they do. You you can go back and try to pull out your old um, Ducktail stuff and 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 give it gravitas if you want to. But now we're actually just getting stuff, you know, getting new stuff in this new era, right. uh, redefined mm-hmm. by these new writers. And uh, yeah, it's going to be a connecting point for us and the younger generations to come. So yeah, I did pick that up. Yeah, Good I re- up. highly recommend it. And <laughs> how are you going to polish us off here? I'm going to polish us off by saying earlier I mentioned Harley Quinn, right? And how m- people may know about, more about Harley Quinn than Dinah. And it's not necessarily Harley Quinn's fault. She has a ton of books that adapt her stories. But more so than that, she is in a bunch of animation. She has her own feature film. That's how you raise the stakes of characters like this. But what m- most people don't know is that Harley Quinn, while having her own comic line now, did not start off in the comics. She's actually a result of Batman the Animated Series. There's other characters like Livewire for Superman that debuted here, or debuted in animation first before comics would end up rolling them in. You never know what character is going to have such a uh, a standout performance in their uh, first adaptation, whether it be movies or comic, oh, sorry, movies or, or television shows, 
where they're so undeniable that you have to bring them into the medium <laughs> that everything else exists in, which is comics. This is the be all and end all. I don't really care how good a film makes. If none of that stuff translates to the books that will be published every month, every week, every year, they won't have staying power. That's how this stuff works. And to make sure that she has staying power, Marvel is putting out on November 6th, Kahori Reshaper of Worlds number one. This is the Babe Ruth rookie card of the That's year, right. ladies and gentlemen. This is the introduction. This is making her canon to the Marvel Comics universe. And that is huge. That's absolutely huge. Um, it's kind of easy to see why a salacious clown stripper would <laughs> would get very famous. <laughs> We get very famous and, and, and um, you know, whether that's deserved or not, well, that's another different conversation. But Kahori is a badass. Kahori is independent. Kahori fights for her people. Kahori don't, don't play no mess. She's not here to be a Disney princess. You know, um, she is here to lead and she, her powers are both simultaneously exciting and horrifying. <laughs> And to have someone of this power, to have someone of this native background, a, 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 a demographic that we pillage and pillage and have pillaged for hundreds of years, for them to get a, because um, it was like, oh, remember, because it was like when, Eva, when Echo came out, I was like, oh, yeah, Echo is Native American. And a lot of people were like, well, I didn't even know who Echo was. So, like, not only did I not know who Echo was, you just saying that she's Native American now doesn't kind of doesn't kind of do anything. And while that series I thought was done well, you gotta believe this is a bit more uh, true <laughs> to yeah. possibly a Native American story that that uh, Indigenous people would gravitate towards. Um, and uh, it, almost very similar. Like I found a lot of those those themes of like liberation and almost fighting back, very similar to the stuff that we saw in Black Panther. You know, a, yeah. a, a, a inner pride that 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 kind of just shines through. And so, um, co-creator of the character and award-winning storytelling teller Ryan Little is actually who's launching this book uh, and launching Kahori into the Six One Six, featuring exciting guest stars and um, and the comic debuts of some extraordinary creators. Marvel Voices brings you an extra special anthology celebrating Indigenous heritage and one of the most exciting characters to emerge from the MCU. Sometime this year, I'm gonna guess possibly around the 28th ish of this month, many people will be sitting around filling their tummies and opening their belts <laughs> amongst family and many people at that table may not know why <laughs> i think it's ingenious that this book comes out this month in particular uh highlighting indigenous people and what they've meant to this country uh what they've meant to our heritage and now will be interwoven into one of the greatest pieces of american media comic books so i'm very much looking forward to uh kahori shaper of worlds number one purchased it already going to put that <laughs> on the lock and key. Uh, and yeah, you got to believe that this is just a, a stepping stone into um, a grander story that she will end up walking into. But what do you Definitely. think when you saw that What If episode? And what, what do you think of the idea in general of her kind of getting roped into this? Oh, she was definitely the, one of the standout characters of season two. And I love the fact that they're going to integrate her into the 616. You know, making her, giving, giving, giving her and giving you know, Native American people, a hero of their own, because even though there have been some Native American characters in the history of Marvel, I feel like none were ever truly elevated. Like, I'll be honest with you. I remember when Echo first debuted mm -hmm. and it didn't really feel like they drew much attention to her Native American background. Uh, a character like Red Wolf. You ever heard of him? No. <laughs> <laughs> He's a Native American character that was brought in like during the 70s, I believe. During the time when you know Marvel was trying to bring in Asian characters and black more black characters like Luke Cage and Shang Chi, they brought in a character by the name of Red Wolf, and you could tell it was this was a character that they they brought in and they didn't do a lot of background research. You know, mm -hmm. The internet, of course, didn't exist, so they probably had to ask like a Native American friend of theirs who maybe didn't know that much themselves. So that Red Wolf character was kind of kind of out of place. So here, though, we're finally seemingly get, getting a proper Native American character that was brought to life beautifully in that in that episode of What If. Mm -hmm. The way the way she goes about what she does when she goes to that other world, 
and she basically figures out a way to get everybody out of that world. And then the, so, as soon as they get out of that world, it reminded me of, of there was a stand-up comedian years ago who made the joke of, man, if, if Native American people could go back in time to when the, the Europeans were, were, were getting off those boats, they'd, they'd have been standing on the ocean showing, do not let them get off those boats. Right. And that's exactly what happens in the series where she, she don't play. She goes, she goes all the way to Europe and it's just like, yeah, nah. Stay, stay right. Dismantles here. the throne. <laughs> I was like, damn, damn, girl. Right. You know, it tells it tells Isabella, yo, shut up. You, yeah. you stay right here. Don't mess with our land. So that was such a empowering moment because you can imagine a lot of Native American people who know their history could just wish for that DeLorean to show up and be like, hey, let me just borrow this for a second and fix up something real quick. It's a revenge um, fantasy, so- right? There's a little bit of that aspect yeah. to it, and I don't even blame them for wanting to fucking revenge in the first place. I just found out not too long ago that Crying Indian c- commercial wasn't the dude wasn't even Native American. Nope. What are we doing? Nope. <laughs> what are we doing? <laughs> <laughs> what are we doing here? <laughs> Bonkers. Bonkers. You know what I mean? And, and for us, we're both we're both we're both Latin men. Yeah. We we look at we look at our history and we're like. Damn. And we could, and we can also tell when we are being, when given a Scooby snack, when it's right. like, yeah, 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 be quiet. They're Hispanic now, you know, or, or yeah, yeah, yeah. we just kind of, you know, I'm looking at you, Hispanic Falcon. I'm looking at you, bro. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm looking at I you. mean, it, it happens. Yeah, we just, you know, hope, hopefully one day we'll, we'll get, you know, I mean, when was the last, like, straight up just, here's a brand new, super awesome Latin Superhero, I'm trying to think. I we just posted not too long ago about White Tiger, and I guess her it's his sister is <laughs> a little bit in that, but she's not elevated in uh most people's minds that don't read comics. I think she's made some animated appearances here and there. Yeah. Um yeah. but yeah, it it's 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 few and far between. <laughs> it is you know, it I mean, is we got we got we got America, I guess, right? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I'm really trying to scratch. I feel like I'm having one of those brain fart moments. I'm really trying to scratch my head uh, and think about a new Latin character of sorts. And it's uh, well, it's I, oh, Miles Morales. Miles, Miles, yeah, yeah. You know what I mean? But you know, it's like okay. It's like, I mean, yeah, I got to see right? um, Arroz and Abichuela on 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 in a film, so that was pretty cool. <laughs> There's pastelas nice. in, in in the video game, in the in the pot. And I was like, oh, that's pretty tight. That's okay. yeah, yeah, yeah. So again, we got, like. We got- in a world where we are a, a melting pot, we are, you know, we are all mixed in this. Why, why not? Why not? You know, someone's got to exactly. stand next to uh, Danny Moonstar on occasion, right? <laughs> Damn. Oh, another Native American character who, who honestly, yes, yes. I would, I would say probably the best. I'm having a hard time trying to think of others. Warpath was kind of thunder, thunder. What was it? Thunderbird, uh, thunderbird, thunderbird, thunderbird came died, and went. He died, died immediately. Instantly. And Warpath. Yeah, he's. It's just like, yeah, we'll give you. We'll give the you worst the most... parts of the worst parts of our Native American characterization, yeah, exactly. which is your bloody savage war right, right. mongering. You, all, you, all you want is war mongering and, and revenge and scalping, war paint, feathers. You know, yeah, yeah. In a world, in a, in a world where mutants can blast and and have these dynamic powers. <laughs> We're, yeah, we're and you'll you be. Two, we're gonna we're gonna give you two knives, <laughs> and we'll put and we'll make you the D character on like a D team. Like he's never, you know. In the top three of any any sort of assembly. He was like, like what well, during when they first did uh, the Brewbreaker run, where they introduced Vulcan. He's in um, X Factor, I believe, at one point. Now, I, I, no, I vaguely remember he was, him. No, he was on the X Men. He was he was on X Force. He was on X Force, but before that, he was on Uncanny X Men for, oh, for a okay. little bit. When yeah. they when they introduced Vulcan and Darwin and those characters. Got you, got you. And yeah. and then they moved him from there to X Force. Right. <laughs> but even on that team. You know, you had Wolverine and Deadpool and and uh, all these other kind of big name characters, Psylocke, and then it was just like yeah, Warpath in the background. With Kahori, though, I feel like with her background, she's undeniable. They can't start her off as anything but at least a B plus player in this. Um, and yeah, it'd be very interesting to see how they flesh out her world. I'm with or it. And shape her world. Hopefully, <laughs> hopefully they they continue to have her at least show up in in the in the What If series. Yeah. And from here, from the 616 debut, I mean, she's basically a cosmic character. Yeah. You can put her into so many different things. So yeah, I'll be put it, put it, put it, really, put really it cool. to use. Put it to use. Let's go, baby. But 
my last pick, speaking of just classic and worlds that we just love to constantly dive back into, and a character that you and I both love, is we got Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles number four. Gang, gang. From the, from the it's, even though it's a, it's a renumbering, it is continuing from where the story t- last, last left off in the previous Teen- Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles series, which I believe went all the way up to issue like 300. Oh wow! It could, it could help me out with that. They like renumbered and kind of legacy numbered everything. I think, mm-hmm. but when now with Jason Aaron, I don't know if you heard of that name. Um, <clears throat> new guy, Jason new Aaron. Guys. Jason Aaron jumped onto jumped onto Ninja Turtles, and the what way to make a wish. It, What's going on here? It's got some guy on the mean? street. <laughs> exactly right. <laughs> um, but no, so he's he's jumped onto the book, and the first four issues, he has given each turtle their own their own story which you know plays up to the previous Ninja Turtle series where it shows where each individual turtle is and eventually how they will come back together as brothers but some of them are not in situations that are too good like our favorite Ninja Turtle Donatello back here mm-hmm. Donnie in issue number 4 is trapped in a zoo for for to entertain rich folk oh wow and so he what i love about this is most people, when they think of Donatello, don't think of, of, of the best fighter, right? Usually that's reserved for Raphael or even Leonardo. Mm-hmm. Even Michelangelo, they, they'll give more play because Donatello is thought of as the nerd, the inventor, the thinker of the team, so to speak. But I like the idea that he is now trapped and has to use his fighting skills and ingenuity to get out of the situation to go reunite with his brothers. And the fact that we're getting... Of course, Jason Aaron telling his fourth issue on this book. And what I like is every every one of the, the first four issues has had a different artist. So the artist on 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 this one, oh man, help me out. I believe it's is, Chris uh, Burnham. Yep, Chris Burnham. Chris, Chris mm-hmm. Burnham. Great artist, has, written, has been behind many, many things. And him on this book with Jason Aaron to tell this great Donatello story, that's going to lead then into the first real story arc of Ninja Turtles underneath Jason Aaron. I'm with it because like we talked about him earlier, Jason Aaron, you put him on a book and he likes to tell different stories. So here he is telling this different story for the Ninja Turtles that, you know, turtles have been, it's crazy to think that the turtles are as old as the, even they are. Turtles are, yeah. believe, are about 40 years old now. Yeah. Yep. You know, 40 years of this ridiculous idea of a teenage mutant ninja turtle. Like that kind of started as a joke slash parody. Mm-hmm. That you know uh, of how strange comics had gotten up until that point, and now you know have their own lore and stuff. I that is one of the saddest covers I've ever seen. <laughs> I looked at the cover for the Ninja you know, Turtles number four, and that is one of the saddest. It's hard seeing my boy, bro, bro. Can someone help him? I want to help him. Where, where's the zoo at? Um, it's. Th- this exactly. is another one of those you know, properties so we're that... getting this horribly sad story yeah no i was gonna say this is what there's another one of those properties that can present itself to be very childlike but can also go into these depths here and you got to believe that jason aaron is not afraid of, of going in those directions right right you know jason aaron is not scared to tell stories like this if you've ever read his scout stuff his southern bastard stuff that where he tells these gritty stories of just underprivileged people or, or or persons going through these absolutely hard luck stories to take because every every issue and so far in the series has had every turtle kind of be in a messed up situation but the fact that we, like you said they got this sad ass cover where yeah. donnie donnie is just locked up in what looks like a prison zoo and we all know he's he's far from some just animal right don donatello yeah. is an inventor a genius so to put him behind bars and have to have him fight his way out or create something that's going to have to eventually get him out of there. I can't wait to read this. I've enjoyed the first three issues, seeing Leonardo, seeing Raph, seeing Mikey get their get their individual spotlight where they have to serve themselves mm-hmm. to eventually reunite as, 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 as reunite the four brothers. Now we're getting the Donatello story. I can't wait to see where this leads into for the next for the next story arc of Jason Aaron. No, it seems perfect. I now that you're talking about it, it kind of seems interesting that one of the aspects that most readers, you know, people who watch the animated series, even films, we often glance past the fact that these guys are animals, like they're actually factually animals. 
Um, and because of how they're presented, their personality, their love for one another, it we very quickly get over that fact. I, in every movie, when they meet somebody, it's a shock initially, but I pass that. They're family. They're, they're, they're human, mm -hmm. just like everything else. This series has gone to great lengths to humanize them. So when you revert that back and they're treated like animals, it's heartbreaking because you don't see them as animals. But right. anyone else would see this as a giant turtle. <laughs> you know? Yeah, he's rocking. Yeah, he's rocking like a headband and knee pads and stuff. But it's just a big ass turtle. And a belt. And a belt. And a belt. I don't know what, what it's holding up. Um, but um they are basically animals, you know, and and it's a maybe even a bigger um conversation about how we separate those who deserve to be you know, kind of trapped and not where, where is that line go? It does have to be a smart animal. You know, does it have to be a, a pleasant looking animal. We treat animals with, with discrimination all the time. I always say that the difference between a squirrel and a rat is a fluffy tail, like, <laughs> but the squirrels PR team <laughs> is killing it out there. Everyone wants a cute little cuddly squirrel, Aww. but a rat, Oh, get that disgusting rat out of here. So, you know, quite That's similarly, right. um, all it takes is for a, a, a closed mind to look at these people and write them off as just monsters, as just animals. And this, it looks like that's exactly what's happening here. So how will Donnie regain not only his, um, his freedom, but his dignity? How, how does he get, even when he gets past the, the, uh, what's keeping him trapped, can he get out of his own mind with the idea that this is how people feel about him? That's jacked up in and of itself. And that brings a bunch of maturity, I feel like, to this overall thing. We are killing it. I am going to be broke because I'm going to grab <laughs> Yes. I'm going to grab majority of these picks, if not all of them. And uh, it does. I, I, again, it's not hyperbole, but this is a very exciting time. This is a very exciting time in comic books. Um, uh, I always thought that. I mean, I got initially when I first first started reading comics, it was the idea that the main event would be the media, right? That's the what gets the most money put behind it. That's what gets these uh, critically acclaimed directors and actors and storytellers around it. And the comic books can serve as you know um, something that kind of heightens it. And no more, no more. Comic books have put their foot down. Comic books are the primary. They're the stake. Everything else is a garnish. These films, these TV shows, these video games are a garnish to the massive stake that is comic books that just keeps getting juicier as these uh, writers uh, continue to put their best foot forward and give us some really, really stellar issues. But speaking of issues, that is the latest and greatest to come to November as far as comic book issues are concerned. And... Um, we're doing a little bit of restructuring behind the scenes with Comic Book Click in general to find ways to get major previews to you guys quicker. Uh, we know you guys are digging the series, and I, you know, this series would not even be a thing moving forward from this month if it wasn't for the tremendous talents of uh, someone you recently roped into all of Comic Book Click. So I'll give you the floor that is, here. That is absolutely correct. We have a new uh, editor for this video. He's someone near and dear to my heart. He's my first born. Omar <laughs> Garcia, who is celebrating his 15th birthday today. So I want to give a shout out to him. Guys, yeah. um, he's doing an absolutely stellar job. Just stand by for all his videos that he's going to be editing for us. And Omar, I just want to say I love you and happy birthday. And thank you so much for joining the, the click because you are definitely, you may not realize it right now, but you are going to be a major member of this group. So I love you again. And thank you so much for being a part of us. A hundred percent. Looks like the cog doesn't fall far from the machine here when it comes to right. when it comes to stuff. The kids incredibly talented and dare I say injects a little bit of youth in this old man's in this old man's club. A little bit. A little bit. <laughs> as our hair starts to thin, as our joints start Arts. to ache. <laughs> as our joints start to <laughs> ache. We have somebody with new fresh takes, new fresh energy. Um he is uh, rounding the corner to getting things to look, uh, you know, getting things to kind of fill the uniformity that is major previews. He's tightening those screws, but moving forward, you'll be seeing a lot of his personality in some of these yeah. editing. It won't just be the kind of stuff that we we're just kind of putting out uh, in general to get these videos out. It's going to have a new influx of energy, uh, a new influx of point of view. 
because Omar um, is incredibly talented, has a unique perspective, and is only going to get better with time. Talk about Babe Ruth rookie cards. Glad he's on right. the team now because uh, in a couple years, he was like, yeah, I remember when I started, you know, and I started doing my minor. You know, when he's on the red carpet and they're like, hey, hi. so <laughs> you've won best feature film. You edited yeah, it on right, an iPhone. Right, right. You know, uh, uh, how that all that started. It's like, well, I started with this, you know, little yeah, did you comedy, hear, comic book Did you ever hear the comic book click? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that guy went crazy and jumped off a bridge when The Rock became <laughs> Apocalypse. <laughs> That was a bad day. That was yeah, a bad it was, day. it was, it was a bad day. But there's nothing but good days moving forward. So make sure that you guys are on the bandwagon before the bandwagon gets full. We'll be back for major previews uh, for December, finishing out the year. Exciting, exciting! As we get closer to our one year anniversary of shooting this series, it's been a labor of labor of love from both of us. And now Omar is putting his love uh, on these projects moving forward. We're continuing to come out with new, fresh, free content for you guys. Um, so just make sure. You you're patient make sure you are here um because this is getting really really fun really exciting but i cannot stop feeling like it's only going to get bigger and better so um if you guys want to help support us the quickest ways to go to patreon.com slash cbc clubhouse for as little as 10 cents a day three dollars a month you can help us keep our lights on here and afford the hardware and the software we need free of charge um uh and you know just help us out here um, and we will see you guys all over our social media, facebook.com slash comic book click, Instagram at comic book click, or use the hashtag comic book click to talk about the newest, hottest, latest, and greatest things to come to comic books and comic book media. And we will see you guys next month. But what? my name is George Serrano, a.k.a. The Don. And I'm Alice Garcia, a.k.a. The Cog. And this has been major previews for November 2024. Join us next month. And always remember that you... Yes, you are worthy. See you guys.